Today we're going to be talking about how to find the tangential and normal components of an acceleration vector. And in this particular problem, we've been given not an acceleration vector, but a position function, r of t, where r of t is equal to cosine of t times i plus sine of t times j plus t times k. And as a reminder, I've written the formulas we're going to need for the tangential and normal components of the acceleration vector. For the tangential component, we write a sub t, t for tangent, and for the normal component, we write a sub n, n for normal. So that's how you can remember them. And these are the formulas we'll be using. As you can tell by looking at them, all we're going to need are the first derivative of our position function, r prime of t, and the second derivative of the position function. Remember that the first derivative of a position is velocity, and the second derivative is acceleration. So we're going to find the velocity vector and the acceleration acceleration vector, r prime of t and r double prime of t, respectively. We're also going to need the magnitude of the first derivative, as you can see in the denominator here. And eventually, we're going to take the dot product of the first and second derivative. And over here for the normal component, we're going to take the cross product of the first and second derivative. So we only need to calculate a couple of things before we can start plugging into our formulas. But before we go there, let's talk about what we mean when we're saying tangential and normal components of an acceleration vector. So just to give you a rough sketch, if we have, for example, this curve here, right, and this curve models the motion or the movement of an object through space. Let's just say that the acceleration vector of this particle as it moves through space, this object as it moves through space, is right here. This is the acceleration vector at this particular point. So at this point here, that's the acceleration vector of the particle. Well, remember that you can always break down acceleration into two components, the tangential component and the normal component. The tangential component is going to be along the line of the unit tangent vector, and the normal component is going to be along the line of the unit normal vector. And remember that the unit tangent vector gives you the direction of motion, and the unit normal vector gives you the direction that the curve is turning. So if we draw, if we use another color here, and we draw the unit tangent vector, so the unit tangent vector might look something like this, and we would just call it t, capital T, for unit tangent vector. And the unit normal vector would look something like this, and we'll call it capital N for unit normal vector. Then the tangential component of the acceleration vector is going to be along the line of this unit tangent vector here, and it's going to extend to the terminal point of the acceleration vector. So if we go roughly like this from this line, out to the terminal point of our acceleration vector, and we go down here because we're going to need this as well, then from this point to this point is going to be the tangential component of the acceleration vector. So it's this distance right here from this point to this point right here. This is going to be the tangential component of the acceleration vector. And similarly, if we go from this point right here to this point right here, this distance, right here, that's going to be the normal component of the acceleration vector. So A sub capital N, the normal component. So really here we're just computing distances or lengths. These tangential and normal components are just these lengths A sub capital T and A sub capital N. And the reason we can do that is because we know that no matter how an object moves through space, we know that its acceleration vector always lies in the oscillating plane, which is the plane that contains the unit tangent vector and unit normal vectors. So we know that capital T, capital N, and A, these three vectors here, lie in the same plane, the oscillating plane. And since they're in the same plane, we can compute these distances A sub T and A sub N. So those are the values that we're actually finding. Now if we want to go about doing that, it's only going to take us a couple simple steps. So the first thing we need to do is compute the derivative of our position function. The derivative is going to be r prime of t, and when we calculate the derivative, we're just going to take the derivatives of each of the coefficients on our i, j, and k components. So the derivative of cosine of t is negative sine of t, so we multiply that by i. The derivative of sine of t is cosine of t, so we get plus cosine of t times j, and the derivative of t is just 1, so we get plus 1k, or just plus k. Now we're also going to need the second derivative, r double prime of t. So if we compute r double prime of t, we're just taking the derivative of this vector. The derivative of negative sine of t is negative cosine of t, so we get negative cosine of t 
times i. The derivative of cosine of t is negative sine of t, so we'll get minus sine of t times j. And the derivative of 1, the coefficient on our k term here, is 0, so we get plus 0k. We can just leave that out. Now we know we're gonna need a dot product and a cross product, but before we get more involved with those, we also realize that we're gonna need the magnitude of our first derivative, which is in the denominator of the formula for the tangential component and in the denominator for the formula for the normal component. So we're gonna need those in both cases. Let's go ahead and compute the magnitude of our first derivative. And remember when we're computing magnitude, we always do this the same way. We always take the square root here. We're working with this function, the first derivative, because we're taking the magnitude of the first derivative. We take each of the coefficients on our i, j, and k components. We square them. We add those squares together, and then we put them under the square root sign. So really, we just write square root, and now we're looking for the square of negative sine of t. Well, of course, when we square that, the negative sign's gonna go away. It's gonna become a positive, and we'll just get sine squared of t. The square of cosine of t is just cosine squared of t, and the square of one is just one. So we get this right here. Notice how we took the squares of each of our coefficients, added them together, and put them under a square root sign. Well, we know that sine squared of t plus cosine squared of t is equal to one. That's a trigonometric identity, and that comes up frequently when we're dealing with vectors. So we can cancel this, and this becomes just one. So we have one plus one. We can see that this is just the square root of two. Now, the last thing we need before we can start plugging into our formulas is the dot product and the cross product of the first and second derivatives. Let's find the dot product first. So we're gonna say the dot product of r prime of t and our double prime of t. Remember that the dot product, we just take the coefficients on our matching terms here and multiply them together. So for example, here in our first derivative, the coefficient on i is negative sine of t. In our second derivative, it's negative cosine of t. We wanna multiply those two together, and when we do, our negative signs will cancel and become a positive sign, and we'll just be left with sine of t cosine of t. Then we're gonna take the coefficients in front of our j terms and multiply those together as well, and we're adding here. So we're gonna get cosine of t times negative sine of t is just a negative sine t cosine of t. Then we're gonna take the coefficients in front of our k terms and multiply those together. Well, we have here 1k, and right here we have 0k. So one times zero, of course, just gives us zero, and we don't need to write here plus zero, we can just deal with this part. Well, notice now that we have sine t cosine t minus, because we have plus a negative, so minus sine t cosine t. Well, of course, that's just zero, so we can see that our dot product of the first and second derivative is zero. Now we need to find the cross product of the first and second derivative, so let's go ahead and do that. The cross product, like this, of the first and second derivative is gonna be equal to, and here's where we need our matrix. So we're gonna have our three by three matrix here where we have i, j, and k. We're gonna put the coefficients from our first derivative in our second row, so negative sine t, cosine t, and one, like this, negative sine t, cosine t, and one. And then we're gonna put the coefficients from our second derivative in the third row. So negative cosine of t, like this, negative sine t, and zero, negative sine t and zero. So now we need to break that down into its discriminant parts. Remember that when we evaluate here this matrix, what we're gonna do is we're going to, for i, for the coefficient on i, we're gonna take everything outside of the row and column that includes i. So we're ignoring the row that contains i and we're ignoring the column that contains i, we're just dealing with these four. What we're gonna do is take upper left times lower right, multiply those together. So cosine t times zero is gonna be zero. So we're gonna say equals zero here, and then we're gonna subtract whatever we get when we multiply the lower left times the upper right. So negative sine t times one is a negative sine t. But because we have this minus here, we're gonna have minus negative sine t, which is really just gonna be plus sine t times i. That becomes the coefficient on our i term here. Now for j, we're gonna take everything outside of the row and column containing j, which is gonna be these two values here and these two values here. So now we have these four components and we're gonna do upper left times lower right. So negative sine t times zero is zero. 
Oh, and one important thing, of course, to remember is that when we're breaking this down into its discriminant parts, we put a positive coefficient in front of i, a negative coefficient in front of j, and a positive coefficient in front of k. So we had a positive sign here in front of this coefficient for the i, but we're going to have a negative sign in front of the coefficient for j. So we write minus and then open our parentheses here. So negative sign t times 0 is just 0. And then we subtract the product of the lower left and the upper right. So negative cosine t times 1 is negative cosine t. But because we have a minus negative cosine t, we're going to get plus cosine of t. And that's multiplied by j. And then we have a positive coefficient here in front of the k. So we say plus and open our parentheses. And then here for k, we're taking everything outside of k's row and column, which is these four values here. And again, we're doing upper left times lower right, so negative sine t times negative sine t is a positive sine squared t, and then subtract the lower left times the upper right, so negative cosine of t times cosine of t is negative cosine squared t, but because we have a minus negative cosine squared t, that's going to give us a positive cosine squared of t, and we multiply that by k. So now when we simplify here, you can see that we're going to have sine t times i minus cosine of t times j, and then sine squared t plus cosine squared t we know is 1 from our trigonometric identity, so we just get plus 1k or plus k. Now remember, that's our cross product. That's the cross product of the first and second derivatives, but our formula tells us that we need the magnitude of the cross product, right, because we have these bars here that tell us to find magnitude. So in order to find magnitude, we're going to go back to our square root method over here. So we're going to say the magnitude of the cross product of the first and second derivative like this. Notice how we're just working our way inside out with these formulas. We found the first derivative, then the second derivative, then we took the cross product. Now we're taking the magnitude. So we've got the magnitude here. That's going to be equal to the square root and again, we're squaring our coefficients. So sine of t squared gives us sine squared of t. Negative cosine of t squared gives us positive cosine squared t, because negative times a negative gives us a positive, so those cancel. And then 1 squared is 1. So we get plus 1, add those all together, put them under the square root sign. And remember, we know that sine squared t plus cosine squared t is just 1. So we get 1 plus 1. This is just equal to square root of 2. So now we have all of our components and we can go ahead and find the tangential and normal components of the acceleration vector using our formulas here. So let's look at the tangential component a sub capital T. So a sub T is going to be equal to, we have here the dot product of the first and second derivative. Well, we found that the dot product was equal to zero, right? We found that right here, the dot product was equal to zero. So we're going to have zero over the magnitude of the first derivative, which we found was the square root of two. So we get zero over square root two, which is just going to be equal to zero. So the tangential component of the acceleration vector is equal to zero. If we're looking for the normal component of the acceleration vector, a sub capital N, remember that we need the magnitude of the cross product of the first and second derivative. We found that here. We found it to be square root of two. So we're going to put square root of 2 in our numerator. In our denominator, we need the magnitude of the first derivative. Well, again, the magnitude of the first derivative here we found to be square root of 2. So we're going to divide by square root of 2. And obviously, we can see then that we get 1. So the normal component of this acceleration vector is equal to 1. So that's it. That's our final answer. And that's how you find the tangential and normal components of the acceleration vector.